Hello everyone. Welcome. We have a mix of time zones with us today. So I'm going to say both good morning and good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Patrick Callio and I'm the MSC Asia Pacific Regional Director. The next hour should be really interesting and informative session as we take you through some of the insights and trends from a most recent consumer survey. My hope is that this session will help you all gain a better understanding of how consumers think about seafood and sustainability and give you some ideas on how best to position your business and engage consumers on this very important topic. To start this session, I'm going to hand over to our GlobeScan partners so they can share some of their key learnings from a most recent survey. They'll take us through their understanding of people's thoughts about seafood and the oceans, what motivates them, how we might encourage consumers to take actions needed in terms of making more sustainable choices and helping them live up to their values. Towards the end, I will then take 10 to 15 minutes of your time to talk about MSC's progress within the Asia Pacific region and highlight some of the work MSC is doing with its partners to raise awareness and build understanding of the MSC program. Hopefully time permits at the end, so we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, please write your questions into the box as we go along. Um, we might not be able to answer all the questions. Um, if not, we'll do our best to respond by email. So in the background supporting us, we have Bill from Workcast and Alex Webb from our global office in London, MSC's office. Um, my name is Patrick Callier. As I mentioned, I'm the Regional Director for MSC in the Asia Pacific. And joining me today is Chris Coulter, the co-CEO from GlobeScan. Chris, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Patrick. Hello, everybody. And I am thrilled to, um, to lead and kick us off um, on some of this important research that uh, MSC and GlobeScan have done together. And, and as we all know, we're focusing on the Asia Pacific region. I thought I would, uh, I'll go through the findings that we have and um, get a, a, give you a sense of, of the methodology bef before we get into that. And this is a, 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 an online consumer survey that we, we did across the world between mostly January and February, but it went up into early March in 2018, so it's all relatively fresh data. And we did a total survey of 26, almost 26,000 consumers across 22 countries. As you can see, we're focusing in today on five uh, countries across Asia Pacific, Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and Singapore, all quite varied um, and variable countries. And uh, um, it'll, it's important to note that in the Asia PAC region, we surveyed 4,795 people, but we also um, identified among the general public people who were seafood consumers, those who would eat seafood um, once in a while. And that's a, a little shy of 4,000 consumers. And we'll reference to those different audiences um, throughout the study today. Uh, this is a study that we um, are, have built over the last couple of years, and 2016 was the first study we did with MSC, um, and this focused on tracking a few of the questions, but really mostly looking at, uh, at uh, expanding our knowledge base so we can understand how to engage consumers and where consumers are on the sustainability of seafood um, spectrum. To give you some background, GlobeScan is an insights and strategy firm, and we've been partnering with MSC since 2015, and, and we take that partnership very seriously, and we're, and we're thrilled to be, to be working together to try and create a more uh, sustainable food uh, system, and especially as it comes to seafood. And our background in this topic is decades long, and uh, we've worked with uh, Fairtrade and FSC and ICEAL, as well as uh, corporate clients such as IKEA and Unilever, Nestle and McDonald's, as well as multilateral organizations like UNEP and UNDP, uh, as well as um, pure NGOs like Oxfam and WWF. So lots of varied experience, and, and this is a, a really important topic to try and engage consumers um, as we move towards a much more sustainable planet. 
so here's the, the overarching thematics that we'll be looking at in the next little bit. And first of all, we want to try and get a sense of um, how people think about the oceans broadly. So we're, we're starting at a very gen, gen, general 30,000 foot view. And then we want to dig into how consumers are responding to these values. And then we'll get into more specificity to understand how do we actually trigger action? How do we begin to mobilize people at scale and pace? And then we'll switch it back to Patrick um, to hear from him on, on what MSC has been doing uh, to engage consumers and some really important work that, um, that the organization has been focused on. But first of all, let's look at some... What do people think? How do they care about oceans overall? And this is a, gr a great question to kind of kick it off um, to, to give you a sense of it. And this is the global um, response to a question that we asked, which was how much would you say you personally enjoy eating fish and other seafood? And you can see the 34% of people across the world really like eating fish and seafood. And, and we've dubbed them seafood lovers. And there's some variability across the world. In South Africa, you've got the highest number of, of seafood lovers uh, in that country, um, and 23% in China uh, are, are the similar type of seafood lover. And, and so there's a little bit of nuance across regions, but generally we're looking at one in three people in the public are, are really quite excited about, um, about being a seafood lover. And then if we ask people um, how much they agree that we need to protect fish so that, that fish will last into the future, and, and very specifically that our children and grandchildren can continue to enjoy seafood, this idea of, of legacy and sustainability and passing on um, this enjoyment that seafood lovers already believe, we have a very strong reaction. So people fundamentally believe and um, agree that, that protecting uh, the oceans and our, our fish is an important part for future generations. And you can see on the right-hand side, the, there's very little variability across the Asia-Pac countries. 83% of people in China agree to this, this proposition, a very similar number in Australia and New Zealand, and then just slightly less in Singapore and Japan believe that um, we need to protect fish for the for next generation um, set of consumers. So that's a core value that people are are excited and, and, and committed around. And then let's shift into then, so if that's the baseline of people enjoying and loving seafood and wanting to maintain that for future generations, how are people then responding and acting on, on these values? And this is a, a really important part of the survey that we took consumers through, where we wanted to identify a whole range of different elements that might motivate consumers to purchase and enjoy fish and seafood products. And then we asked, um, in, in using a, an interesting market research technique to have people rank these attributes as most and least desirable. And from that, we get a sense of the rank order of impact of how do these drive purchase decisions um, and put all of things around sustainability in context of other standard uh, fast moving consumer good attributes. So you can see on the right-hand side, we have things like fresh and preferred brand and price and safe to eat and taste and all the way to the bottom where we're looking at um, country of origin. It doesn't have GMOs. It's sourced locally. And the question is, is how do these things ladder up or stack among consumers from a sense of priority or a driver for purchasing? And here are the results, and, and they're, they're fascinating. So we can see that across Asia-Pacific, we have a couple of very important drivers in purchase of the decision, and that includes safety, safe to eat, and the, the numeric here of 7.97 suggests a very strong level of, uh, of a driver in, in, ship, in shaping purchase decisions. Freshness is an equal level, and we can see that also being quite powerful and consistent. And um, then health, good for my family, uh, also a strong driver. Taste and price also matter quite substantially. And, and then we get down a little bit lower and we can see sustainably sourced, environmentally friendly, and knowing where it's coming from. And then a little bit farther down below, we have dolphin and turtle friendly and sourced locally and caught in the wild and independently certified. So the aggregation of the balance between 
the some sort of baseline issues such as safety and freshness and health also combined with some important sustainability um, oriented attributes such as source sustainably um, independently certified and verified organic all, all of these things ladder up to having a quite a, a, an important duality in how people are looking at things and, and it's important to note that being sustainably sourced isn't the most important right that there is quite a quite a gap between safety and freshness on the on the one hand and getting to the specificity of being sustainably sourced price matters also and price matters in particular in Asia a little bit more than other parts of the world especially in Europe where being sustainably sourced is is more valued as a driver for purchasing it at this stage and then safety is really uh, a fundamental aspect especially in China but also in Japan as a core um, driver for this and the traceability piece is really fundamental as, as, as a part and parcel with this idea of safety and the notion of transparency and traceability and verification and certification. All of these things are pivots off of um, the issue of safety, which is quite fundamental. In Australia, a, a little nuance where knowing where seafood comes from is ranked sixth, which makes it much more important as a driver in Australia than in the other Asia-Pac countries that we've studied. And so if that's the kind of laddering, how do we actually get people to react and um, in, in increase activism and action? And we worked... Um, you know, quite closely with MSC and leveraged a lot of our existing research and experience in how do we mobilize consumer behavior change. And we came up with this four pithy E's, the four E's, educate, equip, excite, and engage. And I'll explain these in turn and we'll kind of give you a bit of a background flavor on each of them. So when educate, we're talking about raising awareness of the issues. Uh, when we're talking about equipped, it's giving people solutions and availability to try and act on some of their concerns and aspirations. Excites is around this inspirational piece of how can we create a more positive vision and, and identify personal benefits. And then finally, engage is related to this notion of catalyzing a movement and um, bringing people uh, to, to some behavior change through inspiration and especially storytelling. But let's begin first with educate, and let's let's have a, a, a look at how consumers have been have been evolving on this educational piece. And and we know from this work and other work that there the, there's been a couple of iconic elements that and, and events that have happened that have sparked more interest and engagement on ocean health and Blue Planet Two, the wonderful series. Um, really had a, had, a, had a global impact. It went well beyond the UK and um, became an important meme and thematic. And the visuals that we're all familiar with now um, became quite viral on social media. And it sparked a big conversation that we know we're sort of just in the, in the middle of or still early on around plastics in the ocean and, and the impacts of this. And, and there's Google search volumes, for example, which demonstrate the the, the increase in volume of searches on this topic. And so we're in a teachable moment right now with, with consumers across the world when it comes to ocean health. And we asked specifically, um, we want to understand whether oceans issues beyond plastic have started to resonate with consumers. And we asked people to choose which of these three um, are issues that worry you the most. And so we can see a rank order where they're across the world. Pollutions are really at the ocean is, is a top issue. And it's true across the world beyond Asia Pacific as well. And 60% of consumers in Asia PAC point to pollution of the oceans as one of the most important concerns. Overfishing and depletion of fish species, also a significant concern for half of the population. And then there's a longer list of other issues which equally um, scientifically important uh, from 
how uh, the, the, the composition of oceans from a sense of chemistry, from this idea of illegal prohibited fishing, the effects of climate change and ocean acidification, both highly connected, and of course, the impact on coral reefs. So all of these issues register to a certain extent, but they are dwarfed most predominantly, predominantly by pollution of the oceans and overfishing and depletion. And part of this in understanding where people are coming from is also how do we reach them? How do we get to them? And we asked people across the world how they'd like to find out more about sustainable fish and seafood. And each consumer was able to choose multiple channels. And on the first blush, we do not have an overwhelming channel that fits every part of the of the population, that there's a very long tail and a heterogeneous um, set of channels that people are looking to. Um, we know that TV and radio and seafood packaging do ha garner the most um, popularity. That's where consumers are most likely to point to and wanting to hear through the news or through um, programming on TV and radio as, as a place to try and uh, understand what's happening to the to our, our oceans and sustainable fish and seafood and then packaging as a point on pack for for consumers at the point of purchase a very powerful piece of the puzzle as well you can see the the variability across here and and the amount of um, specificity that we can get into going forward with certain segments because it's a long list and, and quite varied from restaurants and hotels very specifically to blog sites and to educational facilities but it's um it's quite quite remarkable that people are picking up these uh this information and news from such a disparate set of, of sources so that was educated and there's lots to be done there but we know that that's not sufficient and that the equip uh part of this 4e equation is also fundamental and when we ask people um the value of labeling as a, as a way to equip people, we see a, a great response uh, and, it, and resonance from the population. So we ask people, um, you know, supermarkets and brands claim about sustainability should be clearly labeled by an independent organization. And 66% of people um, ascribe or agree with that notion. So we've got two thirds of the population that believe that these claims um, by mark supermarkets and brands need to be labeled by an independent organization um, to provide that level of credibility and insight that consumers are looking for. And the, there's a gap, however, between the sense that, yes, we want certification, we want independent labeling of any claims that brands or supermarkets are making, yet um, as an individual, um, I'm noticing uh, much fewer of these. So only 27% of the consumers in Asia Pack that we surveyed said I noticed eco-labeled products when I'm shopping. Now that gap is a little bit um, smaller than um, in other parts of the world. In, in Europe, for example, it's much more uh, number of people noticing eco-labels is higher. So we have some work to do in Asia Pack in particular. But we see that there's um, some important differences as well within within this. So in Japan and Singapore have the lowest numbers of people uh, identifying eco labels or noticing eco labels. Only 19% of Japanese consumers, for example, say that they've noticed an eco label uh, compared to um, much higher in China, Australia, and New Zealand. And Singapore, only 26% of people also notice this. So we have uh, a need for um, multi-channel assessments. We have a sense that we definitely do need to find a way to find independent labeling, and yet we are not seeing sufficient numbers of those consumers who, who notice equal labeling to a degree. And when we ask people about um, labels specifically, we, we ask them, have you ever seen the following logos? And we see 28 25% of people across Asia Pacific markets recall seeing the MSC logo. Now that isn't uh, a terrible number. It's one in four that, um, that have some recollection and knowledge of, of the label, but it's quite a bit lower than the global number, which is 41%. And that number has been growing over the last couple of years. So we've, we've got um, to increase the penetration and um, 
and resonance and awareness of the label in Asia Pac to try and bring it up to other regions of the world. And while the labeling and the awareness is a little low, the trust is extraordinary and, and matches the global numbers. And it's, and it's high and it's consistent and it is a number to ascribe to um, compared to other sort of studies that we've done. So it's in a very positive position where 69% of Asia Pac folks and also people across the world trust the MSC label. So that's an important foundation, obviously, for all of the work in trying to engage and mobilize people and have brands um, sign on and be committed to MSC labeling going forward. And, and there is a spontaneous connection. Um, so when people are, are asked to um, understand, you know, what do they think the label means, people, 29% of the population is able to describe and connect the label to ocean sustainability and certification, which is a very also positive, positive piece of the puzzle. It's a little lower than other parts of the world, but it still tells us that we're on the right track to a certain extent in Asia Pac. And and we see there's some fundamental building blocks. Now, this is a, a an interesting analysis that we do, which we call path analysis, to understand how do people get to an outcome. And the two outcomes that are the dark blue boxes. We have a the ultimately someone purchasing an MSC pro, an MSC labeled product, and um, also to have trust in MSC. And we see the connection, the direct connection between the two, that the more people trust MSC, the more likely to purchase the product. So that's a fundamental building block. We also know that the availability of the, and the range of different types of brands and price points on sustainable seafood matters. And it matters both from a trust building perspective as well as from a purchase perspective. And the reason why people trust and, and um, trust an MSC is twofold. It's this idea of, of empowering people to shop more sustainably. We know the power of, a, of an effective trusted label is that it cuts right through the noise and gets people to a place where they want to be very quickly. And it also has the fundamental purpose of focusing on sustainable fish populations and making sure that there's that longevity. And the behind the scenes of those is this idea of being independent, having strict standards, and this notion of openness and traceability. So there's a, a great deal built under the foundation of being a trusted label, and we can see some of the structural building blocks that MSC has built up over the last number of years. And then let's fit, go to the third E, um, which is around Excite, and then we'll move uh, to Patrick for the Engage section. And Excite is a really critical piece because it is around building a positive vision and pulling people towards something. And one of the, the challenging uh, metrics that we found in some of our global consumer tracking is that people are increasingly pessimistic about um, the future of next generations. And, and this, this shows that the, the percentage of people disagreeing that their children and grandchildren have a qual higher quality of life in the future has grown and grown relatively dramatically in this global 16 country study. So we, we have a, a growing sense of pessimism and a lack of hope that we need to, to grapple with when we're talking about sustainability. And so we wanted to test a whole bunch of different messaging and to see what most impacts consumers when it comes to sustainable seafood and fish products. And, and we can see that the top motivating message relates to this idea of future generations. And, and it, it was the, one of the first core values that we looked at. So ensuring seafood we enjoy now, because people love seafood among the seafood consumers, is available for future generations. This is a fundamental message that resonates quite strongly with, um, with consumers across the board. And there's a, se a second tier of messages that are also important. That's one is around we've got to address the, the challenges with the ocean and the ocean health. And that speaks to people's sense that things are, are uh, in, in jeopardy and the ocean plastic conversation fits very much in that. So people are looking for a strong pair of arms to help stop the destruction and reinvigorate it. Um, there's an ongoing thematic of just let's protect our oceans. They're valuable, uh, they're valued, and they're fundamental to the future uh, health of the planet and future um, opportunity and access to seafood. 
and that ensures seafood is is from a sustainable source. That this is these things are all being connected increasingly to that idea that if I'm going to participate as a seafood consumer and maintain that love that I have for it, I need to have that sustainable source element element there. And in all of the work that we've done, and this work can, can, um, confirms it as well, we have this important equation of getting the emotion right, the evidential element right, and the reassurance right to to get people um, to respond and reinforce and activate against um, sustainable seafood action. So I will pause now and pass it back to Patrick to take us through the, the last day here on Engage. Patrick, over to you. Thanks, Chris. I now want to talk about how MSC has gone about engaging our customers or consumers within the Asia Pacific region. I want to give you all a bit of a sense of the type of campaigns and activities we've been running, show how far and wide our reach has extended and hopefully get you all thinking about the opportunities um, and how best to engage your own customers on sustainability. My alternative motive to all this of course is to encourage you all to work more closely with the MSC in your region and see if we can't work together to improve the health of our ocean resources together. Okay so to begin who are we trying to talk to? The MSC's consumer audience definition is value based, which means we're reaching out to our audience based on their interests, not their geo demographics. We want to talk to people that consume seafood, that have a basic knowledge or interest in our oceans, those that aspire to a healthy life, those that want to do the right thing. By doing this, we're engaging with people across every age, culture, geography and demographic, which hopefully allow us to fit really well with all your um, customer definitions as well. Our oceans are essentially everyone's responsibility. So we want everyone to be engaged across all sectors, all ages, all demographics. Our objective is to become the easiest and most trustworthy choice for enjoying wild, sustainable seafood. So when a customer sees the MSC Eco label, they immediately know what it means and they know that they can trust the product is from a well-managed, sustainable fishery. To achieve this objective, though, we need to build both awareness and understanding of the MSC Eco Level. The approach we take is to connect We have a problem with the slide. Here we go. The approach we take is to connect people's knowledge of the oceans to their interest in the food they eat. Most people know something about the ocean. They know things about the decline in fish stocks, overfishing, unsustainable practices, pollution, etc. And we know that people are interested in knowing more about the food they eat, its health benefits and where it comes from. But it's only when people make this connection between oceans and the food in their plate can they really start thinking about sustainability in the context of what they're eating. And this is the critical piece in the change process. We need to connect our deep blue oceans to people's lives and to their plates. Okay, so now we have an understanding of the MSC audience, our objectives and our approach. I wanna to talk to you about the, our growing presence and growing voice in the Asia Pacific region. I wanna highlight some of the actions we're taking to raise awareness and building this understanding. You'll be very pleased to know the MSC program is now firmly established in Asia Pacific. We have offices in Sydney, Perth, Singapore, Tokyo, Beijing, and most recently we opened a, a new office in Busan, South Korea this year. We have staff in Jakarta, and we had standard team members located in Brisbane and Qingdao as well. We have a growing footprint within Asia, and one I'm very keen to keep expanding. For those of you who have been watching MSC for some time, our progress may surprise you. We now have 78 fisheries catching some 1.7 million tonnes engaged in the MSC program right here in the Asia Pacific. It really is a global program, the one we're dealing with now. We have a host of different certified species available coming from this region, 
including toothfish, ling, hokey, hake from New Zealand, lobsters and crabs from Australia, scallops in China and Japan, plus tuna coming from pretty much all over the Pacific Ocean. We even have some non-food fisheries like pearl oysters coming from WA. The last two fisheries to move in the program were octopus and bechamel or sea cucumber. And these fisheries are growing, joining a growing number of fisheries such as clams and abalone and others looking to service the sustainability needs um, of Asian markets. On the market side, our growth is very exciting as well. We have a very mature program in Australia, which continues to grow. Our expansion in mainland China and Japan is happening at an unprecedented rate. And we're seeing fantastic traction in Singapore, Hong Kong and Korea as well. And we're even getting growth in markets like Taiwan, which are evolving naturally without a lot of support from MSC. This growth is being driven by increasing numbers and the strength of commitments made by retail partners. Organisations like Coles, Eon, Japan Co-op, Sam's Club, Timor, and also from strong brands and industry leaders like Zeneco, Ocean Gala, John West, CMEX, and many, many others. I just can't mention them all. This year we had a major breakthrough in China with Shangri-La Hotels and Resorts announcing China custody for 53 of its properties in mainland China and Hong Kong which is a huge development. We're seeing growing realisations of the importance of issues with our fish stocks and big seafood companies starting to take actions. Things like the Sustainable Development Goals and other initiatives have been huge catalysts, as well as looming events such as Tokyo Olympics um, has really brought some focus in these issues. This is great news for the Asia Pacific, but also great news for our oceans. The Asia Pacific is a region that is the two largest consuming nations in the world some 60% of the world's consumption, not to mention Asia Pacific is the largest producing region in the world as well. While all this represents great progress and a really great trend in the right direction, we still have an awful long way to go and much to do in Peru with the help of our oceans. And that's really, you know, essentially what we're here talking about now. Much of MSC's marketing and promotional work is done in partnership with brands and retailers. We have a much, much stronger voice and a greater reach when we're working together. And as a collective, we can have an even greater positive impact on consumer behaviour. I'm going to talk about a couple of examples now. Um, and I apologise, I'm just not going to be able to do justice to them all. One such standout was the work we did with John West in Australia in 2016. John West ran sort of a multi-award winning campaign across TV, including outdoor and in-store activations um, to celebrate uh, sort of what they call their 100% commitment to ocean sustainability. They set out with a goal to, to create a behavioural change campaign that increased awareness of John West as an MSC certified and as a certified sustainable tuna brand. They had aims where they were wishing to raise awareness of the need for sustainable fishing, to drive consumer trust and to position John West as a sustainability leader within the tuna industry. They built their campaign on a journey of agitate, educate, and act. You notice some of the similarities there to the ease Chris has mentioned earlier. John West recognised that it was not enough just to make a commitment to sustainability, but you must communicate and educate consumers as well. Consumers need to understand, they need to believe, in fact, they're rewarding sustainable fisheries when they're buying an MSC label product. This understanding creates a strong connection between customers who want to do the right thing and the brand. It builds trust and loyalty. And this campaign John West ran was hugely successful, with post-campaign research showing 85% of the consumers they surveyed said their perception of John West improved as a result of the campaign. John West continues to work to promote um, the use of the eco-level and educate consumers, not just in Australia, but elsewhere in the region. And that photo on the bottom right there depicts their launch into the China market as well. I want to show you another great example now. Um, when we send you the presentations, you'll be able to follow this link to the Coles TV ad. It's really worth a look. This is shown during Sustainable Seafood Week last year, after Coles won the MSC's Change, MSC Wave of Change Award. The ad shows um, one of Australia's best-known chefs, Curtis Stone, talking about Coles' commitment on seafood sustainability and promoting their certified products. 
Um, also within cold storage, you'll see the MSC used on wet fish counters. You'll see point of sales talking about the commitments and outlining their support for sustainable fish fishing. This is part of what their broader goal about educating consumers um, and on building further trust into the Coles brand. There's an awful lot of great campaigns being run by our partners um, in partnership with MSC in the region. Um, there's a fantastic joint marketing campaign in Japan run by Eon at the moment. It started in June this year and will continue until February, um, including promotions on TV, newspaper articles, catalogues, events for kids, in-store demonstrations and promotions across many challenges. MSC has also been collaborating with retailers such as Olay, SF Best, G Super, and others in China uh, to run kids' education programs on earth, ocean health issues. These fish and kids classes, as we've been calling them, um, have kids doing jigsaws, drawing, um, and doing other interactive activities. Um, and it's all about educating them on how the fish landed on their plate and why they need to protect the oceans. Unfortunately, it's just impossible to talk about all the campaigns we're running. Um, and I can't do justice to them all. But I encourage you to talk to um, your local MSC staff. Um, you can find out more from them, and I'm sure they'll give you some ideas about what you can do to promote your brand as well with the MSC. We've also been doing some really good um, events. Um, we've been running these very successful, sustainable seafood events for the past well, 12 years now. The fantastic tools that allow us to reach out to an audience in a way we could never do during the course of a normal week. And they're also fantastic for our partners because it provides them a platform to talk about the work they're doing. I think Australia was the catalyst for these and they've been running these events for near 12 years now. Um, the event started largely as a sort of communication tool for industry to talk about their work and for MSC to um, platform their announcements and boost um, celebrations for certified fisheries and such. It's now transformed into a hugely successful business consumer event. Um, and the Australia team is working with a variety of organisations. Um, they're doing in-store product promotions, catalogues and digital campaigns, plus a host of media events. Um, this year you'll see up there in the top left corner is a food truck they used in Martin Place in the centre of Sydney to engage consumers um, in Sydney's busy CBD. In China, they've been running a similar event for five years and it's growing from strength to strength. Um, this has been a fantastic collaborative effort between MSC and an organization called CCFA. Um, it involves NGOs, supply chain partners, retailers and brands um, cooperating across China. In 2017, they had 130 supermarket retailers promoting seafood, um, to certified sustainable seafood, which I thought was really impressive. Um, in August this year, however, um, the event was held in across 30 cities in China and um, was supported by a thousand supermarket outlets, over 10 retail brands and their suppliers. Involved in-store promotion, media events and a platform to launch a couple of really strong commitments. One from Eon China with a sustainable sourcing goal and Sam's Club launched their sustainable sourcing policy, one of the first public sourcing policies um, in China. So it was very exciting. Japan's also doing these events with great effect. Um, theirs is run in October every year, so the new ones are underway very soon. Um, last year, 46 companies participated in the event, which is really impressive. Um, I expect participation to be even stronger this year. Last year, in 2017, the event was actually sponsored by or supported by um, one of the most powerful entertainment companies in Japan. So they sent two well-known comedians and actors to support the event. We had some 50 plus journalists, including TV stations in attendance. Um, and to get that sort of um, numbers of journalists in a room, I think it'd be difficult to do anywhere else in the world. And that's the impressive convening power of MSC we bring. The teams also do a host of small engagements throughout the year. Um, they do community engagements, schools, zoos, expos. They do work with restaurants and supermarkets and tag onto bigger events such as our Ocean's, World's Ocean Day. Um, on the top right, you'll see a picture. Um, this is some working that was done recently in South Korea um, at the Korean International Ocean Film Festival. So they're engaging kids. So if you wish to participate in sustainable seafood events, um, really easy to do so. Uh, if you talk to the teams, um, I'm sure they're happy to get you involved. As I said, they're fantastic things to be part of. We're also using um, 
for enlisting the support of ambassadors to really good effect out in the regions. These are individuals we find with a great voice and strong trust of the community. Um, they include you know, celebrity chef types like um, Bart Van Olsen there in the bottom left. Bart's written a sustainable seafood cookbook. He's been travelling around the region talking about MSC um, and his book. Um, and I believe he's even getting this book translated into Chinese, which is fantastic. We've used activists and models such as Laura Wells there up in the top right. She's there doing a photo shoot at Taronga Zoo, another fantastic supporter. We've enlisted the help of well-known comedians and TV personalities in Japan. In Korea, we even have a musician supporting the MSC program, um, singing songs about the environment. So these individuals are really fantastic at helping amplify our voice and creating interest um, with the public. They're also really good at helping us connect food back to the oceans, which we really want them to do. Okay, we're, we're fast running out of time, um, and I've only touched on a few initiatives we embarked on, so I really want to apologise for all those who've missed. Um, this slide is there to remind you all that you know, MSC is active, not just in Asia Pacific, but in many countries around the world, and there's a host of activities happening at any given time. We want you to participate. Um, as I said, get in touch with your local MSC staff. And if you follow the link on the screen there, msc.org slash marketing, um, it'll take you to a number of um, case studies and some great ideas. So in conclusion, um, what do we know? We know people care about protecting seafood for future generation, but not always empowered to act on it. So we need, we've got a role here. So in order to trigger action, we need to educate. So we use those popular channels to raise awareness. Um, we need to equip them by raising awareness of certification and enabling greater visibility of eco levels. We've got to be able to see it. And we need to use a, a multi-channel approach, not just rely on one effort. Um, we want to excite consumers, um, messaging around future generations and sustainable sourcing can help inspire, which is fantastic. Um, we need to engage the power of partnerships and key to engage in the mainstream. And you know, this is the role you, you guys can help us play. Uh, we can't do it alone. And as mentioned, the health of the world's oceans is everyone's responsibility, so everyone has a role to play. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I believe now we've got quite a good amount of time for some questions. Um, so if Chris is there, we, we might I might read out some of these questions and um, take it from there. Chris, are you with us? I am, Patrick, absolutely. All right, fantastic. All right, I've got a, quite a few questions here. I'll, I'll start with the one at the top here. Does this survey uncover anything about the attitudes of younger consumers to environmental or ocean issues? It, Do you want to it does for sure, first? Patrick, and um, it's in, important to note that Younger consumers um, actually consume less seafood than older counterparts, so that's interesting, and, and we need to dig into that to understand more deeply what that what's behind that 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 slight trend. Um, so that's one element, and we don't want to lose um, uh, a new generation to, as, as seafood consumers. And I think that's the power of making updating. Um, seafood consumption with a sustainability angle, which is very appealing, I think, to brands to bring in a, to keep that next generation engaged and, and deeply committed to um, sustainable seafood. We also notice that young folks are a little less concerned about um, ocean issues than older people, and um, so that's that's something else that we need to, we need to look at. And and one of the the things that they are more um, moved by than other generations is just the idea of prevention of ocean destruction. So that, that message that it's all of our jobs to make sure that we're addressing any sort of challenge or crisis is, is critical. Um, the, we also know that young folks are a little more skeptical about progress being made uh, across a whole bunch of environmental issues, including uh, related to the ocean and, and, um, and sustainable seafood. So they may be on the cusp of being lost if we, they don't see action. And in a low trust world, low trust in brands and increasing skepticism, I think that's the power of uh, a, a 
trusted certified label that stands for something quite compelling. And, and I think there's a, a, it was wonderful to see all the examples that you showed, Patrick, of that, that had a good deal of engagement with young people, you know, even school children, but also uh, tapping into those influencers, musicians and chefs and, and models who have influence with them, you know, the, the tweens and, and teenagers and, and even under 24s. Uh, um, across the world, so so those those messages resonate with them, and I think that's the exciting opportunity of of uh, reengaging that group to um, sustainable seafood. Yeah, very good, Chris. Um, I think MSC's perspective, we definitely need to focus our efforts in all ages, but when we're sort of tailoring our messaging and working with different influences to appeal to different life stages, we can do this with really great effect. Um, and like you said, we agree, it's vital that we're engaging the next generation. And this is why, as you said, MSC is investing um, in developing our educational tools. And this is why we do work with zoos and aquaria and schools. Um, and these groups are vital to bring these um, messages to life for us as well. Yeah, and just to build on that a little bit, Patrick, just the, I was at, involved in the Google Food Program, which is a really interesting initiative, which I, I hadn't known existed, but it's been around for about five years. And they're focused on um, a food shot, they call it, you know, 20, 50, 10 billion people eating healthy and sustainably and having a, a sustainable food system overall. But what's interesting is that they, the event I was at in the spring in California was very much focused on how do you engage people through a cultural lens, which I think it speaks to younger demographics as well. But chefs, they identified as a really important voice of getting celebrity chefs out and speaking about these issues was an important channel to try and catalyze both media and earned media views, um, but also getting people switched on and excited about trying different foods and approaching it differently and taking a sustainability lens. So it, it was wonderful to see the examples that you showed of, of uh, the Australian chefs um, talking up sustainable seafood and uh, MSC certified seafood in particular. I think it's the right strategy. Yeah. And to be honest, this is some of the really fun stuff, the really innovative stuff as well, um, mm. which we'd love to be part of. Okay, we've got another question here. I might let you start with this one, Chris, as well. Are there any differences in gender or other demographic, demographics sorry, in attitudes towards seafood purchases? Yeah, we, j just as in other um, aspects of the new consumerism, which I think has a lot to do with sustainability, um, it, we do see that female consumers, women, tend to prioritize sustainability higher than, than men. And, and that's consistent in both their behaviors and purchasing and also some of their concerns. And, and that, so that's an important piece. And we know there's an ongoing um, skew in who is buying for the household. It tends to be women more than men. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle, right? If we're trying to target and, and be effective, that we know that women are, are more uh, engaged and excited about these issues than, than men, and they're also more likely to be doing the shopping for themselves and their families. So it's an, they're an important note in all this. Um, there's an exception in, you know, in China. It's a, it's a little more even between men and women, but um, I, th I think that the importance of engaging uh, women on their terms sometimes around sustainability has been a proven uh, up escalator for getting activism and uptick. And, 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 I, and I say that not just because they're interested on seafood purchases, but across the board on any other lifestyle health issue, we see women much more concerned and more engaged and more active. So that's something we want to continue to cultivate. Yeah, these are really important insights. Um, from MSC's perspective, um, our role is not really about driving sales of seafood and sort of targeting um, with that motivation, but taking a sort of broad brush to raising awareness and understanding advocacy of the MSC solution. So understanding that choice, it's about choice of the MSC eco label. But you know, knowing where people live, how much you earn can impact values. Um, and we use our sort of value based definition as a means to target these consumers based on the interests as well. So yeah, it's really good insights. and. And hopefully um, MSC's value-based definition I mentioned before fits well with you know where you're targeting your brands and where you're targeting your sales as well. 
and this way we can have a sort of increased collective impact. Okay, Chris, um, let's move to the next question. Uh, it's actually about plastics. Does the panel think the current focus on plastics is here to stay, and does that affect concern around overfishing? It, it's such a, 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 a remarkable phenomenon, isn't it, how plastics seem to have come out of, <coughs> ocean plastics seem to come out of nowhere, and yet um, has galvanized so much action and concern and reporting and activism and corporate response and, and brand response. So it's one of those remarkable phenomena. And I think it's, in, it's instructive at a high level to look at plastics as not as a one-off issue for when it comes to ocean health, that any other of the potential challenges to oceans and seafood sustainability could also have the same galvanizing effect. This is the tip of the iceberg. So we, need, we, we as brands need to be prepared to think of what the next issue is, what is our point of view, how do we get ahead of it, and how do we build trust in advance of these issues. So the plastic, ocean plastic issue I think is, is, is important because it's so visceral and visual and because it goes against um, or it taps into all of the, the deepest concerns people have around environments and what that means for the future of themselves and their family, very self-interested perspective, and also how that connects to um, what we put in our mouths and what we feed our children. And so all of these things come together at one point in ocean plastics, which has a really important um, implication for the seafood industry that we need to um, respond to it we need to be aware of it and we need to know that these are not isolated concern issues that they bleed into others in many different ways so i think the lesson from plastics is that we've got to we've got people who are listening and, and interested they're deeply concerned and they're looking for ways to be empowered to make a change and and that's where good labeling like MSC and combined with partnership with good brands who have that point of view and that consistency, uh, you know, understanding their consumers' deepest concerns and understanding their consumers' deepest aspirations, which is what, you know, strong marketing is all about, that th these things align for a moment to respond to this sort of issue. And, and so I don't think that there is any fading of these issues and, and especially among the young generation again if we look at it it's not just plastic it's not just overfishing but it's also climate change and we are on the cusp of um, you know more extreme weather events and also highly engaged young folks talking more about uh, climate change and we know the impacts that this has on o ocean acidification and coral reefs and and broad health of ocean ecosystems so we're we're really i think at the early early stages of a deep engagement from consumers and regulators and brands and those who um, understand it will be around 10 years from now. And those who don't, I, I honestly think that there's a, a great uh, risk to the longevity of any brand that doesn't commit to uh, more sustainable approaches. Yeah, I agree totally. Plastics is one of those, it's, it is a big problem. Um, it's up there with climate change. It's a very visible problem. People can see it when they get out in their parks and on the beaches. Um, and it's not a problem that's going to go away anytime soon either. So yes, we, we need to be upfront and engage on it. I think from an MSC perspective, there's a real opportunity for us as well, as Chris mentioned, to leverage these issues. Um, any discussion about ocean health is an opportunity um, for us to talk about seafood sustainability as well. Um, and it's inspiring people to take action um, and it's creating um, champions as well. So these um, issues, while, while horrifying, um, can present an opportunity as well. Like we want to improve ocean health overall, um, you know, and seafood sustainability, um, ocean plastics, um, climate change, it's all part of the problem. And it's and it's and and I think and you said it best earlier, Patrick, that there's this this um, real gap for how people feel 
and what they're able to do and their level of knowledge and engagement so far. And, and that gap is very frustrating to people because people deeply care about all these issues when, when you ask them, um, but yet they don't have the tools at their dispos- disposal currently to make a difference. And, and, that, and that's the future role of brands, I believe, that brands can play a very powerful role in addressing those anxieties that people have and demonstrating what the you know the good life looks like and redefining what the good life looks like and deepening loyalty and and bringing people along and the whole notion of purpose and and brand purpose which has also exploded you know in uh, the last couple of years is uh, a moment in time for brands to look at an issue that's so germane to their business in the seafood world and ocean plastics and the responsibilities that come with it, but take it, take it in stride as a way to really drive re- renewed interest in the brand and renewed um, loyalty and commitment to that brand and engagement. And, and, that, and I think given the, the, the enormous opportunity to, for MSC to penetrate more brands and more products across Asia Pacific in particular, this is a huge moment to try and scale up some of this, this and, and bring it all together. Okay, thanks, Chris. Chris, I've been logged out of the webcast, so you I, I have to ask our next question. Okay, I think this is... Um them telling us our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I did see a, a, a methodological que- question asking around how could we possibly represent Asia Pacific with four thousand consumers, and it's a very good question. So, as you saw, we're talking about five countries in Asia Pacific, and so we're we're you know we're not representing the entire region. Indonesia isn't included, for example, a very populous country, but. Um, what we do know is that surveying a thousand people randomly sampled to the best of our abilities in an online panel, um, which is getting better every day and, and does represent the consumer um, reality very well, that a thousand people, even in China, is sufficient, that you can, with proper um, rotating and um, engagement, represent a fuller population. And it's a very counterintuitive approach, but... but um, but we've, you know, we and all other market researchers have been using this technique for decades, and it's a sound, solid technique. So, so we are capturing the representation, and, and we can even get into deeper segments as well. Okay, great. Now, Chris, I was told if you refresh the page and log back in, um, we can get access to the page again. And we've got one question, yeah. one more question we might attempt to answer here, mm-hmm. um, and it's about. It goes, interesting to see that sustainably sourced is quite a bit more important than independently certified. So it's a question about the numbers you presented. Mm -hmm. This question raises for me is whether people are making the connection between sustainability and reliable and independent eco-labeling. It's a great question. So, and I think that the challenge, um, you know, from a technical perspective, all of us on the, the call today understand some of these nuances and differences and see them sometimes as quite separate. The sourcing conversation, the independent verification conversation, the transparency element, I mean, all of these things are uh, describe the complexity of what a really strong label like MSC delivers. I, th- I think what's important from a consumer perspective, is that all we're looking for as consumers are heuristics, you know, these shortcuts that cut through the cut through the noise. And if we can imbue that label or that signal, just like a brand, to to uh, to to mean multiple things, like sustainable sourcing together with independent certification, together with quality, together with transparency and safety, this is when it becomes deeply meaningful and you you have the kind of impact that we all want. And and that's what's really critical. I think that there's that the MSC label, like any other good label or other good brand, can and should represent a a, a good deal of complexity, but in a way that is, is, is simplified and motivating. And, and we can see that from the numbers that we, we have that, right? We've got 69% of the populations in Asia Pacific trust the MSC label. People spontaneously, one in three, get it. They understand the behind the scenes. Then we see that 66% believe that there should be more certification label. All of these things add up to a way to 
to cut through. And we shouldn't view it linearly. It, the, these things are all very interconnected. And that's the, the, the marvelous opportunity we have to try and imbue them with all of these things that people want from safety, you know, it's a huge issue in China in particular, with the need for transparency, with how things are done, and then make it the quality emblem that's become something really powerful and catalytic. It's where it comes from and the providence related to it. And that's the opportunity we have with, with a label like MSC, I believe. Yeah. MSC invests a huge amount of time and energy in sort of building trust into the work we do um, through transparency and through the rigors of our process. Um, we know that trust is so incredibly important. Without it, you know, everything just falls over. Um, and you know, a label is just noise on a pack, as you mentioned earlier, Chris. Um, so yeah, trust is, is just so incredibly important. We'll continue to bolster it, but I don't think consumers need to know all the information about what we're doing. Um, but they need to understand that it is a trusted eco label that they are indeed um, when they purchase an MSC eco label product. That it does indeed come from a well managed and sustainable fishery. It's essentially what it's all about. Chris, any last comments from yourself? Just uh, to say thank you, Patrick, for organizing it, and um, thank you for all of you who tuned in and asked uh, really great questions. And um, to reinforce that I think we're on the cusp of something very exciting. We've got 12 years before the SDGs need to be achieved. We've got a purpose revolution that's happening with brands. We know partnerships are the way of the future, and now we need to get more participation from consumers and empower them and, and deliver what they want, which is the most effective way to, to, to build loyalty and, and uh, market share. And, and so all of these things have aligned at a very nice time with the, a label that you have all created with, that is so powerful and, and uh, built for, for the, the moment that um, it's just now it's time to get, get busy <laughs> and execute. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, thank really you. appreciate you spending the time with us. Um, and just the audience, thank you for joining. Um, if you have additional questions, um, please send them through. Um, we'll do our best to um, get back to you, um, and please talk to your, your local MSC officers as well. They're there to support you, um, and they could talk endlessly about the campaigns they've run, the experiences they've had. Um, thank you once again, and I wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick.